This is part five, the gait cycle. Uh, the gait cycle, as you will see, is a very critical piece to understanding normal gait and abnormal gait. And the gait cycle is one complete stride, which is repeated over and over again as we walk on the level surface. We describe gait using three standard planes. The first being the sagittal plane from the side. And this shows us flexion extension at the hips, knees, and foot and ankle, as well as pelvic tilt and lumbar lordosis. The coronal plane is as if looking at the subject from the front or the back. And in this plane, you can see abduction or adduction at the hip. There is cervalgus at the knee, foot and ankle, as well as pelvic obliquity. The third plane is one that you don't see visually, but you can reconstruct in your brain using your three-dimensional vision by looking at the coronal plane and perhaps also the sagittal plane. And in this view, we see rotation of the trunk, leg, and pelvis, as well as the foot progression angle, which is the angle the foot makes with the line of progression of the body as the subject walks. So the gait cycle is divided into specific events occurring in the sagittal plane, beginning with foot contact. So the gait cycle begins with foot contact and ends when that same foot, after going through a complete cycle, contacts the floor again at foot strike, and this describes the gait cycle, which you will see in a moment is further subdivided into several different phases. But the gait cycle begins and ends with foot contact, and that constitutes one complete stride. The gait cycle is divided into stance phase and swing phase for each leg. Stance phase begins with foot strike and ends when that foot lifts up off the ground at toe off and this constitutes about 62% of the entire gait cycle. When the toe lifts off the ground, this begins swing phase where the leg swings forward and gets ready to accept weight for the next step. This constitutes 38% of the total gait cycle. Swing phase ends when that foot strikes the ground and then the next gait cycle begins. So stance phase begins with foot strike when the foot touches the ground and is further subdivided into three portions. The first being first double limb stance. When the leg accepts weight, uh, it's sharing with the opposite extremity. But as the body progresses forward, the opposite extremity begins to lift off the ground, and when it does uh, at opposite toe off, then we go from this first double limb stance phase into single limb stance, which constitutes 38% of the gait cycle. And during this phase, the body progresses forward in space as the opposite limb is swinging and the opposite foot strikes the ground again and then we go from single limb stance into the second double limb stance phase. When the toe comes up off the ground, then this constitutes the end of the second double limb stance phase and the beginning of swing phase. So toe off marks the end of stance and the beginning of swing, which ends when the swinging foot lands on the ground to begin the next gait cycle. For the foot to efficiently clear the ground during swing, foot clearance must be achieved. And for this to occur, there must be adequate hip flexion, knee flexion, and foot dorsiflexion. Foot strike marks the end of swing and the beginning of stance of the next step. And thus, we go through the same cycle over and over again. Now, as you know, the goal of walking is to move the body forward, and our muscles provide the power to accomplish this. 
So I'm going to talk in the next segment uh, about how the muscles work during the different phases of gait. And this is that wonderful animation from the book by the uh, Gillette Group. And this shows the muscle activity as we progress through the gait cycle. The muscles that are working concentrically, that is providing power and contracting as they're firing are colored green. Whereas the muscles that are providing control are being stretched as they're firing and are working eccentrically and are there by colored red. And you can see everything works in a very finely orchestrated fashion. So when the foot accepts weight, the weight is born on the end of the calcaneal tuberosity. And the ankle joint is, of course, anterior to this. So as the body progresses forward and more weight is placed on the calcaneal tuberosity, the foot's going to go into plantar flexion, which is induced by this mechanical activity, not by the plantar flexors. And if there were no opposition to this, um, then the foot would just slap on the surface. However, at this point, when the foot is accepting weight, the tibialis anterior is working eccentrically to control this mechanically induced plantar flexion and allow the foot to, to gently uh, go into a foot flat position to accept weight for the next stance phase. When the leg accepts weight and the foot becomes flat, then the gluteus maximus along with the hamstrings begin to work concentrically to extend the hip and move the body forward in space. The hip extensors consist of the gluteus maximus and minimus, which constitute 80% of the hip extension strength, and the hamstrings, which constitute 20% of the hip extensor power. In early stance, the knee goes into a slight amount of flexion as it accepts weight, probably to act as a bit of a shake, shock absorber and as well to diminish the vertical oscillation of the uh, center of mass. And during this phase of flexion, it's stabilized by the eccentric activity of the quadriceps above as well as from the ground reaction force of the gastroxoleus below. But as soon as the knee achieves full extension during mid and late stance, the knee is not maintained in full extension by the quadriceps activity. You can see here in this animation, the quadriceps is rather quiet. But the main force that keeps the knee in extension is not the quadriceps activity, but the ground reaction force arising from the eccentric contraction of the gastrocnemia soleus. So normally in mid stance, there's a strong gastroxoleus which keeps the foot from going into excessive dorsiflexion as the tibia advances forward over the planted foot. And this is known as the plantar flexion knee extension couple, which maintains the vector anterior to the axis of rotation of the knee. However, if the lever arm of the foot is weakened due to a weak gastroxoleus or abnormality in position or function of the foot, the vector goes posterior to the knee as the foot goes into excessive dorsiflexion due to advancement of the tibia over that planted foot and then crouch will result. And this will require an excessive amount of quadriceps eccentric activity to keep the knee from collapsing. And this is known as crouch gait when you have excessive dorsiflexion uh, associated with excessive knee flexion during stance phase. And the vector here is behind the knee. In addition to maintaining knee extension, the calf muscles are also kind of a brake pedal, which control the forward momentum of the body and keep the velocity throughout the entire gait process rather steady, uh, rather than fluctuating uh, 
quicker, slower, quicker, slower, etc. The velocity uh, is maintained in a, a relatively steady fashion. So in summary, the gastroxoleus is one of the most critical muscles to gait. The, ga the uh, gluteus maximus and hamstrings power the gait, but the gastroxoleus controls the body during the forward motion during stance phase. So as the center body progresses forward in middle to late stance, the triceps surrey works eccentrically, uh, both to prevent the foot from going into excessive dorsiflexion and thereby preventing excessive knee flexion. And it also controls the forward motion of the body and keeps it smooth. During single limb stance, when the opposite foot is off the ground, the pelvis is stabilized in the coronal plane by the abductors, which are balanced by eccentric activity of the adductors in order to keep the pelvis level. Muscle activity in swing phase, which begins with toe off and ends with foot strike, is primarily the hip flexors, which bring the swinging limb forward to prepare it to accept weight and begin stance phase at the next gait cycle. In addition, the kinetic energy of the swinging limb also helps to propel the body forward. The foot must be held in dorsiflexion by the tibialis anterior, which keeps it in position to accept weight evenly and provide a stable platform uh, during the next stance phase. In light swing, the hamstrings also begin to work a bit eccentrically to slow down the forward progress of the limb while the quadriceps extends the knee and the tibialis anterior maintains the foot in dorsiflexion. The stretching of the hamstring also puts it at an optimal uh, resting length so that when stance phase begins, and it begins working concentrically as a hip extensor, it can provide maximum power to do this. So foot strike marks the end of one gait cycle and the beginning of the next gait cycle. So it's critical to understand these uh, events which occur during the gait cycle because you can look at the um, subject walking at each joint and you can identify where abnormalities are and in what phase of the gait cycle they occur. And this is what we're going to focus on during the next section.